for you. Yeah. Is the lighting too, too bright? Great. All righty. So we are going to open up uh, with a word of prayer, and then we'll get things going. So if you will please uh, pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the many blessings that you have poured out upon us. Uh, God, we pray that you would be with us today, be present here in our study, as we seek to know more about you, to learn about your word, and to hear what you have to say about us and about our lives and the work that you have done for us and the work that you desire us to do. We pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okie doke. So, a preliminary comment. I, I'm a big fan of your comments, your questions, your participation. So please do feel free to, to chip in whenever you want to. If you've got a comment or a question, just raise your hand and flag me, flag me down and we'll go from there. Um, but yes, I'm Daniel. If you don't know me, I think I've met most of you. Um, but this is my practicum assignment along with Michelle. And we're heading out after this. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're at the end. So thanks for having me one more time. And today we're going over Mark 11. So let's get things underway. Uh, to begin with, I want you to just start, if you were here last week, that's great, um, if not, no worries, but open up to Mark 10, look through what you learned last week, I wasn't able to be with you, I think it was Dr. Blanco that uh, taught for you all, uh, who was it? Tim. Oh, it was Tim, okay, great, well thanks Tim, well then you can just tell everyone at your table what you taught, <laughs> uh, but pull out some key learnings, uh, just refresh your memory of uh, what you learned last week, and I'll give you a few moments to do that, so share with the table. Share with me. 
what Jesus had said, and they went with the colt. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and they sat up. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the field. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Perfect. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. So now I'll take a few moments uh, to look back over the text and then with your table we'll discuss this. Specifically, going back to these things, we see Old Testament scriptures fulfilled, we see expectation versus reality, and we see this coming reign of God and how it looks different than what the people are thinking. So look for these themes, I'll leave them up here for you and discuss with your table for a few moments. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. So that would be the Old Testament. Yes. 2 Samuel 7, 11, 14. I still want to hear something from Jewish and Isaiah. Unbroken animals. Verse 2, verse 3 says, You who fear the Lord, he returns. Okay, so he returns. Here, we've, we've got that fulfilled, right? Second Samuel. <laughs> right. Expectation versus reality. We thought he was going to be the new king. Mm -hmm. that's, not, that's not what he came for. King, right? He came to be our savior, not a king. The coming of the end of the ages, great God, that's the precious start of giving us the end of the Yes. Okay. Important thing. All right, take a few more moments, and then we'll bring it back together. Short. Somewhere of him coming on a donkey. 
Yeah. No, I'll, I'll take you there. That's great. We'll, we'll talk about that, definitely. And what were some of the other things we saw? We talked about the donkey, too. It's like a sign of humility. So um, the people were still really welcoming Jesus as kind of their warrior king. Mm -hmm. But he, he fulfilled that expectation in a much different way. He was kind of already alluding to that by perfect. coming in on, on a donkey and not a war horse. Yes, I love that. That's perfect. We'll go there as well. Any other? Yes? Well, in the Old Testament it says too that um, animals that had not been used previously were used like for religious ceremonies like there. I love that you all are pointing out the things that I want to teach today. So, <laughs> let's go through those three things. Uh, we talked about uh, the reference to the Old Testament. This is for our viewers online. Uh, the Old Testament scripture being fulfilled, right? That the king comes riding on a donkey. And then this group talked about how this points to Jesus' humility, right? And the expectation for a warrior king, but how Jesus actually fulfills his coming reign in a different way. And then we're also going to talk about what's the significance of this donkey. Well, there are a couple things. Um, so let's go through that. So here are the scriptures that specifically are fulfilled. I'll read these out loud for you. The first is from Zechariah 9 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then this is from Genesis 49, verses 10 through 11. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in one. Perfect. Why is, so first of all, it's really cool that there are two verses, or well, this is three verses, but two passages from the Old Testament. I know it's a little small, I do apologize. Zechariah 9, 9 and Genesis 49. Um, it's, it's amazing that these scriptures are being fulfilled so perfectly. I mean, you see this language here, lowly, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, full of a donkey. Um, and this is exactly what Jesus asks in a verse. Let's see. Does anyone see the verse? Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat, untied and bring it. Um, so this is the colt, the foal of a donkey. So there's some interesting things going on here. So let's first talk about the significance. There are, there are two uh, ideas here going on. So yes, uh, the donkey is pure in two different ways. First, it's a, a purebred animal, which means that it's not a mule. Um, it hasn't been crossbred. It's a pure male donkey. Um, but also, it's pure in the sense that it has never been ridden upon. Um, and this is really interesting because it, there's this uh, significance of sort of ritual purity, uh, the purity that Jesus is coming to bring, as we, we will see as he uh, cleanses the temple later on in chapter 11. So you see this theme of purity. But there's also something, going back to when Jesus healed Bartimaeus, he showed his divine authority, his power over creation of authority over human life. And here, the other interesting thing is, if, if you never trained a dog, and then you took that dog for a walk, and you told him to sit, roll down, you know, go fetch a ball, would the dog do any of that? Especially if it's a puppy. No, absolutely not. So here Jesus is bringing this untrained animal, and he sits on it, he's the first person to ever ride this, and does it, you know, buck him off? Does it run rampant through the streets? No, what does it do? It just submits to him because Jesus has authority over it. So this is a, a small hint that we see that Mark is pointing, pointing us towards, hey, what's happening now is different. This guy has authority over life. He has authority over creation. Uh, so that's super cool. And then as you see here in Genesis 49, the scepter, what is the scepter that 
is being spoken of here, the scepter of Judah. It's going back to this uh, theme of the third one, the coming of the eschatological reign. What does a, what does a king have? A scepter, a crown, these are signs of their royal authority, right? So what's being spoken of here is the fulfillment of the promise, right? The fulfillment of the first promise, even all the way back. Uh, so have you heard the term proto-euangelion, first gospel, all the way back in Genesis after the fall, uh, and the promise that one will come from Eve, uh, who will come to fulfill and to make right and to rule. Um, and this is the scepter that's being spoken of here. And as you know, Judah is one of the twelve, correct? Uh, and Judah is the line from which Jesus will come. What is this language down here of uh, tied to a vine or his cult of the choicest branch? What does that make you think of? Church. He is the vine and we are the branches. Yeah, that's definitely... That's definitely a good one. So the vine and the branches. And then there's also an Old Testament reference about a vine shooting out of branch of Jesse. Yeah, the branch of Jesse. Uh, so this would be alluding to the line of sort of the son of David. And this is Jesus who's coming in to fulfill this. We probably need to keep moving. So here are some comparisons that are being drawn. This is expectation. This is reality. This is what people want from a king, and this is what people get with Jesus. And you get what you get, you don't throw a fit. So, let's turn to 1 Samuel, chapter 8. That's in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel, chapter 8. And who can fill in on their Old Testament history? Before they had kings, what did Israel have? Judges. They had judges. And they got sick of these judges. And uh, this is where we see the institution of the, the king of Israel. So, people there, 1 Samuel 8. Yeah. <clears throat> We're going to begin with verse 4. Do I have a volunteer to read 4 through 9? So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said this, but when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king, as they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Thank you so much. Um, and in your spare time, you can look through verses 10 through 18. This is, I'll sum it up for you. God is saying, you're not going to like the king that I give you. And the reason why is because he's going to rule over you, and he's going to take a tenth of everything that you have, and he's going to take your sons and your daughters, and uh, he's going to take your livelihood, pretty much. He's going to rule over you um, because he's not a righteous ruler. He's an earthly ruler, and this is the way that things are going to be. And if you really want this, I'll give it to you. I don't think that you should want this. And then let's look at verse 19. Um, but the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No! There should be a king over us, so that we may also be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So this is what the people want, and they're sticking to it. Uh, so this is where Saul becomes the first king. And uh, does anyone remember the story of Saul at the very beginning? What is his description? 
he's, he's kind of a big burly dude. He's handsome, he's got big muscles, uh, he's got a good lineage. People are like, ah, I know Saul, he's a great guy. I would love to, you know, be subject under him. Um, and they pick Saul for this reason. Um, so this is what you see here, that they want a king like all the other nations. And what we just read, they want someone who has military prowess and who can lead them uh, in wisdom. Um, but as you see, this is juxtaposed or compared the opposite with what Jesus actually brings. Um, so the ideal ruler is not one that is like all the nations. The ideal ruler is the one that points people back to the understanding that God alone is the ruler of the people. Which Jesus does because if he's the ruler, he is the very son of God, meaning that he alone is the king over his people. And instead of the ideal earthly leader who has military prowess and relies on their own wisdom, Jesus, what does he do throughout the entire New Testament? He goes back to his father in prayer and relies on God the Father for strength and for wisdom. It's, uh, he doesn't, you know, assert his own strength and wisdom out of the, that which is given from God. And then there's also this, uh, do you remember the story of David um, when David is out in the fields and uh, which prophet was it that comes? Is it still Samuel? So Samuel comes to, to Jesse's house and they're the, the older brothers and all of them are big and burly and strong just like Saul. And uh, even Samuel thinks, well, yeah, this, is, this must be the guy. He's, he could bench me. Um, and ultimately, the person that God chooses is the one who has a heart after God. And that's a heart of humility. And where do we see this illustrated in this triumphant entry in Mark? Going back to what Micah said. Do you want to say it again? Yeah, Jesus is humble. Yeah, he becomes humble in writing on the cult full of the Bible. Um, and this is incredible that we see this perfect opposite. It's like a mirror image, but it's the better version. This is what we want, this is what we get, and it's so much better. Now there is one other interesting point here about this donkey. Every time that it mentions a king in the Old Testament, the king rides a mule. And in this, uh, in this Old Testament scripture, this is the only time that it mentions a king riding on a donkey in these passages, which is another tip-off from Mark and from Jesus, because he's fulfilling the scriptures, that this guy is different. Uh, his reign and rule is going to look different. Um, so he rides in on a donkey, so signifying a different kind of ruler. Okay, so again, expectation versus reality. Um, as you can see, this is a you all know what typology is? It's kind of like, no. this is one thing and it corresponds perfectly to this thing. So in the Old Testament, there are types or like images that point towards the fulfillment in Jesus. Um, but Jesus is always the better fulfillment. So again, this is Saul. Uh, he's big, he's burly. And what do they get? They get David, who's uh, small and scrawny and has a heart for God and relies on God against uh, Goliath. So in the story of David versus Goliath, Saul actually tries to give this little boy, David, his armor, uh, which shows you what kind of heart Saul has. Yeah, go out and good luck. Um, and David rejects the earthly ways, rejects Saul's armor, and he goes out and relies on the Lord. And this is what happens. He chops Goliath's head off. All right, so now a point of application. In what ways do you find yourself having unrealistic expectations of how God is supposed to work in your life? supposed to work in your life. You know, the people, and we can talk about this more, they had one certain expectation of what Jesus was going to come and do, right? They were ushering in a king, someone who could liberate them from the Romans, someone who could be uh, the Messiah, the, the earthly king. And this is why they're saying, Hosanna, uh, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. And what they're saying is true, they just don't realize what kind of kingdom it's actually here. Uh, so this can be a fault that we have in our own lives. So we'll talk about this with your table. What are those ways that God is supposed to work in your life? And how do you, how do you react when he doesn't? Uh, and I'm not asking you to air your dirty laundry, but if you want to share with your, with your table. I think we Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, God answers prayer in his time yeah. to do the he thinks it's something he should have. Right. So, right. Yeah. 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 Want versus need. Yeah. 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 Uh, so just to review, uh, so far we've seen Jesus coming in in a humble manner, but also in a very kingly manner, but not coming in as the king that people would expect, not coming in in the way that people even wanted him to, uh, but coming to do something different. And that's what we see coming up here in this next passage. So we're going to kind of breeze through the biggest chunk of Mark because they actually, they are parallels and they teach us uh, one kind of key lesson here. Um, but yes, expectation versus reality. Pick on this this week. Um, I feel like there was one more thing I was going to say. Oh, it's too late now. Okay, so Mark, and this will be 11 through 14. Oh, this is what I was going to say. Uh, what do they do with Jesus when they find out that <laughs> he's not the type of king that they want? Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Give us Barabbas, give us a insurrectionist, give us someone who is going to... So, thief, uh, and this is an insurrectionist, a brigand, and that's exactly what they want. They want someone who's going to stir things up, like stir the pot, uh, you know, fight against the Romans, and that's not what Jesus came to do. Okay, so Mark 11 through 14. I have a reader for these verses. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went to Bethany with the twelve. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat from you again. And his disciples heard it. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so what we see here, I'm going to explain this really quick, and then we're going to go into the next two sections. So what Mark has for us here are stepping stones. Um, so he goes to the temple, then to the fig tree, then back to the temple, then back to the fig tree. And what Mark is doing is he's creating these stepping stones for Jesus temple, fig tree, temple, fig tree, because what Jesus is saying about the fig tree and what he does to the fig tree correspond to what Jesus is saying about the status of the temple. Uh, so, does that make sense? Are there any questions about that? Okay, so can I have another reader? Mark 15, Mark 11, 15 through 19.
Thank you so much. And can I have another reader for verses 20 through 25? In the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree wither away to its roots. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if you say that this mountain be taken up and thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Okay, thank you so much. So here, we're not seeing a juxtaposition, we're seeing a parallel. The fig tree and the temple. Uh, so in the Old Testament, um, figs, it's used several times. Figs represent peace and prosperity, along with a, a full vine, like a grapevine. Just a common crop, right? Uh, so if there's an abundance of this crop, it represents prosperity. Um, but when there's a, an apparent lack of that prosperity, it symbolizes doom, right? Uh, judgment. God's divine judgment. Um, and in this instance, Jesus is saying, the system that is in place, the temple system, is doomed. Meaning, it doesn't have a place in my coming kingdom. This is, this is the old way. I am the new way. So what were some of the ways that the temple operated? Good and bad. Good and bad. What did they have? Who, who did the work for the people? Priests. Priests. So they had priests, and these priests were intercessors, mediators uh, between the people and God. Uh, there was even like a big back there. If this was the the holy the holy place, but then that was the holy of holies. There was a curtain separating the people from God, and you couldn't even go into the holy place. The, the priests had to go in uh, for you on your behalf. Uh, and what did the priests offer for the sake of the people? Prayers and sacrifices. Uh, so there's this whole sacrificial system, uh, and this is for the atonement of the sins of the people. Again, the people are corrupt. They're unholy. God is perfect, righteous, and holy. So the people cannot be in the presence of God, meaning that there has to be someone standing in between. And that's what the temple's for. And that's what God instituted the temple for. And that's good. That's, that's why he made it. But then there's also some corruption going on. So look back, uh, verses 15 through 19. What's the corruption going on here? They're using it as a market. Yeah, um, because people are coming in with their currency, mm -hmm. what they have, and then there are money changers, and the only money that you can use to buy the only sacrifices that you can offer is the temple money. So then they're being upcharged, right? They're trading their money for what is equivalent, less, right? Uh, so then the, the money changers are making a profit off of this. And then anyone who's bringing in their own animal to sacrifice, even if it's their choice, you, you know, their best, their first fruit, it doesn't matter because it's not totally pure. So you have to buy it from the temple. Um, so there's this corruption that is going on. They're making it a house of trade. Did you have a comment? No? Okay. Um, so they're making it a house of trade. And this is kind of uh, what we see here. Uh, when you come up to a fig tree, if you see, or any type of tree, if it's leafy, if it's green, it looks like it has life. And this is exactly the hustle and bustle going on in the temple. It looks like it has life. People are coming, uh, they're offering sacrifices to the Lord, the priests are doing their holy work. But really what's going on is it's an active temple full of a den. It's a den of organs, right? We're back to this thief talk, this thief language. Uh, so the, the leafy tree that doesn't bear fruit has the appearance of health, but it's actually not healthy. And then there's also this idea of if the Lord of life has come to you and you're a tree, you better bear fruit, right? If you are grass, you are green in the presence of the king. If you are a tree, you bear fruit in the presence of the king. And this fig tree doesn't care. 
So Jesus curses it, and this is a representation of exactly the type of people who are here in this temple uh, at the very end. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it, and they were seeking a way to destroy him. They didn't receive their coming king because they couldn't wrap their heads around the rule of Christ looks different. It's not what we expected. It's different, and it's better. Um, and then finally, the withered tree uh, points to the destruction of the temple, which comes in AD 70. So that did happen. Uh, so Jesus called a shot. So here's some scriptures that are fulfilled. This is Micah 7. What misery is mine? I am like one who gathers summer fruit at the gleaning of the vineyard. There is no cluster of grapes to eat, none of the early figs that I crave. The faithful have been swept away from the land. Not one upright person remains. So Jesus, again, this hunger that Jesus has for figs maybe actually represents the hunger that he has for people to receive him. Uh, and then you know all of the passages about Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you under my wing as a mother. And uh, so Jesus longs for his people to receive him, and they don't. And that's exactly why he came, because he knew that they wouldn't receive him. So this is the new way. Uh, Jesus reassures us that our Father in Heaven still hears our prayers and forgives our sins, but not by means of the old way. Jesus himself is the replacement for the temple. He is now our great high priest and our mediator. He's also the Paschal Lamb, the final sacrifice made for our atonement. He is Emmanuel, the presence of God with his people. So following the triumphant entry, the stage is set for the coming of the new age in Jesus, that eschatological reign that we've been seeing. The old is fulfilled, the new has come. Okay, so to close today, I'll give you a few moments to reflect, and if you have to go, I'm not offended. Um, reflect on your old ways for which Christ has died in order that they be put to death. What does the new way in Christ look like for you in your day-to-day -day life? Feel free to share with your tables, reflect on that, put it in the yeah. Something for you to take with you into this coming week. I just think if we fail in our, you know, if we sin, it's always present. So trusting in God's timing, yeah. trusting in His way, and not our own plan. It's funny when things don't go according to plan, and we're like, I, you know, didn't you see the script? I drafted it up really nicely. 
Yes. Christ to replace the temple and uh, sacrificial giving. And mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and now that has been fulfilled for us. And now he's still even our mediator. You know, this isn't just for Jerusalem. This is for the whole world. He is now our high priest and the final sacrifice. Well, I guess it's interesting because as each one of us live, we move through different changes and we get different perspectives. Mm -hmm. But I think the, what the real answer is that every day you live, you should live as if this was the last day of your life when Christ was coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's Go bear some fruit, right? Yeah. Live as if uh, you're in the presence of the king and bear fruit for him. Um, yes. Thank you all so much for your attention today. Yeah, I'm going to close in prayer real quick. Father in him, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die for us, to be our intercessor, our lowly and humble king. And we look forward to the day that we can live in this kingdom for eternity. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you all so much. Thank you. Sorry, it's like drinking from a fire hose at the end. I was like, there's so much content to get through. You're always under the gun. Thank you. 